Hi everyone, should we stop? Should we start the next session, please? Next panel. So this is one of the most fascinating topics that I've been learning, as I said, I've been learning about healthcare as we go, was the, I think that the, the notion that rural healthcare is actually one of the most under-researched topics as well. That's, that's of general understanding. So, and we have a fascinating paper by Paul and Caitlin. So I'll let them, them start with it. All right, and uh, all the stuff's over there. Yes, I think the clicker is there. All right. Um, well, thanks to uh, the organizers for putting this together and for including this topic on the program, rural healthcare. Um, you'll see that as I go through, this is kind of like a bit of a smorgasbord, I think is the right term, in that basically, like everything that you think could go wrong possibly with healthcare is is arguably exacerbated in, in rural markets to some extent. Um, so we, did this work? Um, Should be working. <laughs> there we go, okay. So we're gonna be focusing today um, on thinking of the supply side and, and providers um, in the rural context. Um, you may uh, have heard that there's a lot of concern about rural healthcare markets. Um, part of this concern is, is about um, recent supply side contractions and consolidation. Um, so in the last, since 2005, there have been 180 hospital closures in these markets. 11% of rural hospitals have merged. Um, and these, these, uh, uh, conditions of limited competition, poor access, and um, also low quality extend beyond hospitals. There's a statistic about, you know, 77% of rural counties report primary care shortages. You can find similar uh, statistics of similar spirit about just about any sort of provider um, that you can think of. Um, and on top of these supply side uh, uh, restrictions, there's demonstrably poor quality in rural or in rural settings relative to urban counterparts. Um, this could be for a lot of reasons. Um, and one thing that's important for us to understand, we, one like place of where we think there's potential for some research is digging a little bit into why that is. And so from the, we kind of wrote this from the perspective of IO economists. And we think that from the perspective of the IO economist, rural healthcare is a really interesting venue to try to explore if these undesirable outcomes that we see can be actually be explained by market failures. It's not necessarily clear that it's the case. Um, and then on top of that, follow, or following up on that, is there a role for regulation? Okay, so uh, rural markets are often uh, characterized as having low, oftentimes shrinking demand. And if you take that and pair it with um, a reimbursement system that, that rewards volume, and then the fixed costs that are often high fixed costs that are often associated with, with healthcare, what you end up with you, is you end up with really uh, thin markets, variable demand that can disincentivize entry and investment. Um, and then because you have this low density, you, it, it stifles a lot of the mechanisms through which productivity is often realized. Um, and this is especially acute um, there are some especially acute trade-offs in this setting where, you know, the, the, the market will only support so much supply. And so you could think about how uh, there, there are especially acute trade-offs to the market organization that's realized. So if you think about a, a market that has a few providers, well, they, this could be good because these few providers can achieve economies of scale, they can benefit from returns to experience, but there's also going to be these trade-offs in that there are going to be costs associated with market power. There's gonna be decreased choice, travel costs, things related to that. So we think that um, the big picture policy questions are first, how should we think about structuring healthcare markets in, in rural settings where demand is so sparse? And to, to inform that question, we think there's a lot of value in really getting down into the brass tacks of figuring out like which services, for which services is there really high value in keeping them local? and which ones can effectively be, be moved to some sort of regional or remote uh, provision. And then if we have answers to those kinds of questions, we can start then asking questions about, well, how can we use regulation or technology to promote you know, regional healthcare provision or, or, or remote provision and thereby improve the efficiency of, of these rural healthcare. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about current healthcare policy, and then um, Caitlin is going to talk about uh, where we think there's a lot of space for um, future uh, research. Um, but the takeaway in this discussion of um, about um, uh, current policy is that in a lot of ways, uh, rural markets have been left out. Um, so the, when the prospective payment system was introduced in the 80s, there was a rash of rural hospital closures. And out of that was born what's called the Critical Access Hospital Program. And this allows hospitals to opt out of PPS and into a cost-based reimbursement program. And that has been fairly effective in keeping some of these hospitals open, um, but it does have trade-offs. Um, and in particular, if you think about many of the modern reforms that you know, a lot of you know, people in this room, people on, on the Zoom have studied, um, most of those operate through the prospective payment system, which means most rural, many rural hospitals are just being excluded from, from these types of reforms. You could also think about some of the voluntary reforms that, that have happened. So if you take um, accountable care organizations, um, it's really difficult in these rural settings for these for organizations to, to meet the minimum number of Medicare beneficiaries they need to form an ACO. And when they do, they often span really large geographic areas. And then that's gonna make, comp that's gonna make coordination within the ACO really hard. Um, there's also, they have fairly limited uh, like uh, caseloads or small caseloads, I should say. And so uh, that leads to having variable costs and, um, and that complicates their efforts to raise capital that they need to invest in infrastructure that you need to have an ACO. So for these reasons and, and others, um, rural uptake for a lot of these voluntary reforms has also been uh, comparatively low. Um, so now for the rest of the talk, we're gonna, we're gonna discuss what we think are some ideas um, that could potentially make this improve the rural healthcare situation and also emphasize uh, um, the research that would help inform some of these ideas. Uh, so for starters, um, it's worth rethinking a little bit how we finance healthcare in the rural setting. So currently that's mostly through these, these two things, these top two points, there's the uh, critical access hosp hospital program. And for some services, Medicare in particular uses uh, rural add-ons. The idea is let's just pay a little bit more for some services if, when they're in rural setting. For example, this is used to support uh, home healthcare. Um, and first, like, there has been some research about these, but we think from, from economists especially, there's, it's worth spending more time researching some of the implications of these programs. So for example, we don't have a good answer for how uh, the generosity of critical access hospital programs affects quality of care. We also don't know a lot about how effective these rural add-ons are. Is there, are they something that can substitute uh, for cross-subsidization that, that oftentimes supports some of these low margin specializations? Um, and there's also some uh, policy discussion about more of a dramatic rethinking of this financing. In particular, maybe we could think about using a, a payment system that resembles more of a two-part tariff to support healthcare in um, local markets. So you have this lump sum payment to cover fixed costs and then followed by an episode-based payment. Um, and we think that, that, that there is some discussion about this and it's an interesting idea some, some ideas of things that, that of research that could help inform that policy, help try to teach us how we could get that policy right. One is just like, we need to think about how would you wanna target a policy like that? So if, if, we're, if we're all on board with uh, these rural hospitals being natural monopolies, that's gonna change how you would target it versus if, if you disagree with that. Um, then also how to like structure the payments of this policy to better reflect the hospital cost structure and just in general, what sorts of behavioral responses might we expect to see um, from, from hospitals or other providers that, that we may reimburse with some sort of two-part tariff system? Um, and now I'm going to turn the time over to Caitlin. She's going to take it up. But um, the idea, a big idea is if you want to like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just stay right here if anybody's okay. allowed. Uh, yeah. So it varies, but it, a lot of times you see something around 20 to 25%. So um, 
When we're thinking about the goals of uh, an alternative payment structure in rural areas, we should think about sort of what we want the outcome of a payment reform should be. So in particular, should we set payment levels to maintain the structure of rural markets in their current form, or should we restructure payments to incentivize change? And the main tension here, which Paul's already articulated, is that declines in demand over time have left us with you know, hundreds, if not a thousand rural hospitals that are largely empty and really expensive to maintain. But if you close them down, it is harmful for patients with certain medical conditions, in particular time-sensitive health conditions like heart attack or stroke. So this has um, motivated a new set of ideas where maybe we should sort of strategically downsize rural hospitals so that they're no longer offering generalized inpatient services, but they continue to provide high value local care, for example, emergency care. Um, this actually has some traction from policy standpoint and an implementation standpoint. So Congress has authorized this new type of uh, hospital, I'll put in quotes, as of 2023. Um, we can have rural emergency hospitals which actually don't provide any inpatient care at all, but they do provide emergency services and they do provide outpatient care and they continue to enjoy sort of higher hospital-like rates. So when we think about um, restructuring rural markets in this way, I think it raises two key questions. The first is what services should be provided locally and what services um, should be provided regionally. So when we think about um, this first question from a conceptual standpoint, it's really about targeting local support to services where the cost of losing access is quite high, but regionalizing services that are say highly specialized or have high fixed costs where these efficiency gains are gonna win out over the cost of losing access. The second question is, if we downsize rural hospitals to focus on a particular set of services, how should we structure care for people who can't be treated in their local markets? To treat these patients, probably rural hospitals have to uh, build new affiliations or new referral networks with larger urban facilities. So that raises a really important question, which is how should we think about consolidation in these rural markets? Um, I probably won't belabor this point in this room, but there's a long and thoughtful literature on hospital consolidation, basically showing that it increases prices with little improvement in quality. And the question is, how should we think about these results translating to a rural setting where scale efficiencies are potentially quite high from consolidation and where uh, coordination benefits from say a new affiliation are also potentially important if it uh, is a way to facilitate access to diversified services in rural areas. So I think when we think about research needed in this area and we think about is consolidation desirable in rural areas, it's important to think about what is the counterfactual outcome in these markets that don't have any merger activity or any sort of system acquisition. So should we think of consolidation as a desirable alternative to closure? Um, or even if consolidation leads to an increase in prices, maybe it's still a preferable alternative to facilitating access to specialized services in rural markets. Um, where otherwise they would require just massive subsidies to, to provide these services independently. Uh, Paul already mentioned there's a lot of um, consolidation happening in rural markets, which potentially opens the door for research. One potentially interesting angle here is some of this consolidation has been facilitated by COPAs. So these rural markets have been effectively shielded from normal antitrust review um, under the guise of sort of maintaining access. So that could be an interesting angle. Um, hospital closure is not certainly not the only problem in rural areas. Another really important challenge is a shortage of clinical workers. The shortage really runs the gamut when you think about sort of what types of providers might you want in, in any sort of market. So there's a, a shortage of primary care physicians, probably gets the most attention uh, from a policy standpoint. Um, there's also a shortage of specialist physicians and a shortage of other types of clinicians like behavioral health specialists, people like that that you think might be really valuable in rural areas that have been, say, hard hit by the opioid epidemic. Um, there's a lot of current policies in place that try to address these shortages, and none of them have been very effective. So one popular program is loan forgiveness for rural providers, medical school loan forgiveness. Um, it turns out when you implement these programs, they do increase the supply of physicians a little bit, but not very much. So it basically looks like these programs have been transfers to sort of inframarginal physicians that would have practiced in rural areas anyways, even without these programs. Um, scope of practice laws where nurses can practice at the top of their license and potentially substitute in for primary care physicians have also had only a, a small effect and they're also probably not a realistic solution for different types of shortages, say a specialist shortage. So I think when we think about designing uh, sort of more effective policies in in rural areas, the key question is sort of what is the cause 
of these rural shortages in principle in a well-functioning labor market. We have a shortage, it should drive up wages, that should you know, attract more workers to the area. Clearly, we're not seeing that happen. So the question is, you know, are there features of the healthcare system that are impeding these sorts of compensating differentials, for example, administered prices um, under public insurance? Another sort of interesting question is how these physician shortages and hospital shortages interact in the labor market. So do hospitals exercise monopsony power in these areas if they're the only facility around, or do shortages um, give physicians some sort of countervailing bargaining power? There's been, of course, um, huge swings in sort of clinician employment and wages and location decisions during the COVID pandemic. So that could be a natural place to start in terms of sort of research opportunities. All right, so telemedicine is another possible solution to a local provider shortage. It's also probably a key component to any sort of rural market restructuring. Uh, there's sort of two versions of this. One is patient to provider telehealth where patients can talk to their providers remotely instead of having to travel a potentially far distance to care. The second is provider to provider telehealth. So this is when the rural providers themselves actually get clinical support from a more specialized provider. Telehealth has been um, sort of touted as almost like a silver bullet type uh, solution in rural areas, but adoption of telehealth has actually been slow in rural areas relative to urban areas, just like a lot of technologies um, for similar reasons that other technology adoption has been slow in rural areas. Um, a lot of providers lack the resources to adopt telehealth in the first place. There's not infrastructure in place to support it. Namely, there's not broadband in a lot of rural areas. So how are you gonna have an effective telehealth um, situation? So I think the question of how to promote telehealth in rural areas is still very much open. I think that it's particularly interesting and important to understand what drives these provider to provider telehealth relationships because um, that's going to facilitate access to specialized care in rural areas, and it also has implications for market power and uh, consolidation of physicians and hospitals are making new long distance relationships. Uh, there's clearly been a, a huge expansion of telehealth during the pandemic. That's probably the obvious place to start if we want to think about how do telehealth expansions impact uh, people and providers. Okay, so I'll briefly conclude with the broad question that I think motivates this chapter, which is how should we provide medical care in rural markets, where we know that thin demand means that we can't support a large number of providers, and we know that quality of care is sort of falling behind urban areas over time. If you think about um, what policies are trying to do here, the policies we sort of talked about today, the broad goal is that they are trying to reduce the cost of care, but minimize reductions, or minimize interruptions to access. So that's sort of the idea with downsizing hospitals and with telehealth. They're trying to kind of have the best of both worlds in this cost um, to access trade-off. Even if these policies are, policies are successful, uh, they're very likely to have effects outside the healthcare industry, given the importance of healthcare employment in rural economies. So I'll leave that as a final note. Hospitals in particular are viewed as sort of anchors of their local community. So any sort of attempt um, to reform healthcare in these areas is gonna have huge political economy considerations. And with that, I'll hand it over uh, to our discussants. Thank you very much. And we have Elena in first. 